As if the McCrispy couldn't get any better, Bacon and Ranch just entered the chat. The Bacon Ranch McCrispy, available at participating McDonald's for a limited time. Ba da ba ba ba. This episode is sponsored by State Farm. Choices are great. Like with your podcasts, you get to choose what you want to listen to. And State Farm believes insurance should work the same way. That's why the State Farm Personal Price Plan helps you get the coverage you want at an affordable price and a policy that helps cover what you value most. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com today to create your State Farm Personal Price Plan. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. Honest, passionate, and doesn't pull any punches. It's Paladino Joey on the Purple Mafia Show, here on thesportstuff.com. Welcome to the family, here on Purple Mafia. I am your host, Paladino Joey. Or Joey Awajan. Purple Mafia is available on the sportstuff.com and on iTunes. I thank each and every single one of you always for downloading and listening to this show. And I do mean that. <laughs> I wish our circumstances were better than they appeared uh, at the end of the game. Um, they started so well. So well. 14 0 Minnesota. Rock and roll. After a boring first quarter for the most part, things ended wonderfully on a, with a nice uh, drive. With another uh, Matt Asiata smash into the end zone. Not the most exciting, not the prettiest thing in the world, but hey, he went forward. <gasps> oh my god, he went forward. And yeah, it's a touchdown. And then another very impressive drive after that. The Detroit Lions couldn't even get a first down for the longest time. In fact, at one point, the Minnesota Vikings had nine first downs, Detroit had zero. There was a point in this game when the Detroit Lions finally got their first down, the crowd erupted in cheers. Yeah, sarcasm, right? Yeah, we'll get back to that later on in the uh, fan interaction segment, which, of course, is the third segment, as per usual, during the game review part of the season. You know, like the main object of Purple Mafia to review games, at least this half of the year. <laughs> Otherwise, off-season shows are always very, very fun, and postseason shows are very, very fun as well. Dylan Richardson, most likely, most likely, will be joining me, yes, sir, for the entire postseason. Uh, You know, schedule permitting, of course. That's why I can't say 100% chance, because schedules are what they are. Things come up, or things, yeah, things snowball the way they go as well. So, just bringing that up. Remember those fun, classic (laughs) postseason shows me and Dylan have done over the years. And then last year, not so much. Not, not. I mean, we only got the Super Bowl last year, unfortunately. But, but at least that was fun. I mean, it made up for not being able to do the shows before that. Uh, just couldn't reach him. Stuff like that. Tough schedule. You know, it just is what it is. Sorry for uh, digressing off into La La Land. But, hey, eh, it's show related, I suppose. Oh, my. The Vikings digressed into, into La La Land after a wonderful start, didn't they? Things looked so good. So good. Oh, 14 nothing Minnesota. Teddy Bridgewater sharp as a razor out there. Sharp as a wakazashi. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Whatever it is, I'm just saying. You look at the quarterback comparison in this game. Just You just look at this right here, and it just makes tears come down my cheeks. It, it really does. Matthew Stafford, yeah, I've compared him to Carson Palmer, and he basically was Carson Palmer. You know, the Carson Palmer that was mediocre. Uh, most of the time, sometimes really good. Sometimes Matthew Stafford is really good, and he throws for 300 yards. And sometimes he has games like this, where, well, I guess his completion percentage was 60. (laughs) So that part was a little bit better, but that's only because that was later in the game, per se. He got a little better. Only 153 yards. No interceptions, though. No interceptions. No interceptions. (laughs) The most frustrating statistic of them all is, look look at the quarterback ratings between Teddy Bridgewater and Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford, 87.4. Teddy Bridgewater, 84.9. You know, very close, right? Do you realize what Teddy Bridgewater's quarterback rating would have been if not for sudden mental farts, basically? Forgive the, uh, well, I guess it is an analogy some people use, but yeah, mental farts by Teddy Bridgewater suddenly. All of a sudden, his accuracy went from extremely good to 
overthrowing guys. And it was consistently overthrowing guys. Throughout the game, Charles Johnson overthrew him badly, really badly. That was the first interception. That was extremely costly. The second one, ah, I don't know. (laughs) Dare I call that luck, but yeah, it was a great play by the defender, yet at the same time, extremely frustrating. But what really broke my heart, though, was what we saw from Teddy Bridgewater, and I was tweeting about it right then and right there. What was so heartbreaking about it is I was tweeting about the fact that, you know, Teddy Bridgewater really struggled against Detroit last time, and this is the first time Teddy Bridgewater has played against a team twice, you know, in the same season. So, meaning he got his feet wet against that team, got a chance to get into the, uh, you know, got a chance to get into the videos and, and study and learn, study Detroit's tendencies. You know, imagine that. A quarterback, a young quarterback, finding holes in a defense with the talent of Detroit's and the fact that he was actually doing it, he was actually finding holes in Detroit's defense. And of course, yeah, obviously you credit Norv Turner for that as well, but still, Teddy Bridgewater completing the passes he needed to complete. In fact, believe it or not, despite despite the porous second half from Teddy Bridgewater, who of course got zero points in the second half, not all his fault per se, but uh, despite the not as sharp second half by Teddy Bridgewater and part of the second quarter, his quarter uh, his completion percentage over 75%, still 315 yards, still but no right as I tweeted it, literally right as I tweeted it, he threw the interception to, to Quinn, I mean it's just I, I, I just almost cried, you know, Glover Quinn that is, who returned it 56 yards and ultimately Detroit scored very quickly after that, just broke my heart hmm couldn't believe it. Because <laughs> it was almost right after that he threw another interception. Almost right after that. Unbelievable how the game can go from 14-7 to 14-10 so quickly. It looked like the Vikings were going to go up 21-0. to zero. Detroit, their fans. The pl- I remember looking at the fans, it was so telling. <laughs> the fans, you know, close to the field, the... They weren't on the field, but close to the field. They're just staring, staring into into empty space. They just had that look, you know, that glass eye look like, yeah, this is not going well. I'm really, you know, like, great. The Lions are going to let us down again. You know, that was basically that look. We we all know that look around, the, around here in Minnesota with several teams over many years. Not just the Vikings, but so many other teams. Like when the Twins were getting hammered by the... Anaheim Angels in the postseason, or the Yankees, God forbid. Yeah, we, you know, we, we, there. You saw that stare. You saw the stare when the Philadelphia Eagles were beating up on the Vikings in the playoffs. When the Chicago Blackhawks were beating, I mean, got that lucky bounce against the Wild in Game Six last year. And when <laughs> we were getting our butts kicked by Green Bay because we had Joe Webb on the field at the last second who couldn't complete a pass to uh, the Pacific Ocean in that game. He was just throwing ground balls. He was just, you know, he's just throwing ground balls at Green Bay Packer players in case the, you know, in case maybe it's baseball practice. You know, he figured, yeah, here's here, here's some ground balls for you. That's basically what that was in that uh, contest. But that was the look the Detroit Lions fans had. <laughs> and it changed so oh so dramatically after that. You could just feel it. Yet the Vikings defense kept them in the game the entire way. And I mean the entire way. There wasn't a point in this game where like, oh, Detroit's totally taking control of this one. That was the difference in this game versus others, like the Chicago game and the Green Bay game and such, when the defense was just, you know, was not getting the job done at key times. The Vikings had just chances to win this game throughout the throughout the way. We actually stopped the run. We actually stopped Detroit down the stretch. But it didn't matter. It just didn't matter because Whatever sharpness Teddy Bridgewater had and his teammates and whatever it was, whatever it was, was just completely gone for some strange, I have no idea, reason. I mean, uh, sure, you're going to get shell-shocked when you're doing so well and you're going to throw an interception and such, but the dramatic change was quite disappointing. At the end of the day, still building blocks, 
baby steps and all that good stuff. It looked like <laughs> it looked like mammoth sized steps though for the longest time. Unfortunately, all for naught ultimately in the end. Vikings losing 16-14 in this one as mentioned 55,000 times along the way. Oh, and by the way, we'll talk about eh, we'll we'll get to Adrian Peterson in the fan interaction. I don't even want to talk about it. You know, do you really want to talk about Adrian Peterson? Ah. Let's talk about a Viking defense that looks, well, looks really good. And a statistic that was brought to my attention after the game today. The Minnesota Vikings' pass defense has given up a 300-yard game only once this season. Oh, my God! <laughs> that's pretty doggone good. Uh, that's extremely good. And, of course, you notice, did, uh, I almost called him Sam Bradford. <laughs> it might as well be Sam Bradford, but Matthew Stafford. <laughs> did he throw for 300 yards today? No, he threw for half of that. What does that tell you? That tells you the Vikings' defense is a hell of a lot better than it was last year. With almost all of the same players, I might add. Anthony Barr didn't play today, folks. No, he didn't. Almost all of the same players that the Vikings had last year, particularly in the secondary, with the exception of Captain Munderland, who a lot of people would tell you is the weakest link in the secondary this season along with Robert Blanton, but <clears throat> yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> Not everybody's going to improve, but even Blanton at times has been respectable. At times. And he uh, kind of was the past two weeks, but then again, uh, anybody would look respectable when the other teams were as, <laughs> were as lousy as they were. Still can't believe we went to overtime against the New York Jets, but eh, you know, we'll have to let that one slide. guy by the name of Gerald Hodges shined brightly today. That's for damn sure. He was almost an urban legend, like I said, for a while there. And then all of a sudden, there he is, back again, playing well, and looking like a looking like a starting linebacker in this league. Lots of energy. And, of course, knocking down two passes. Can't beat it. I mean, that, that, that's great if your linebacker's knocking down two passes. Josh Robinson was respectable today. Not, not great, but at the same time, who out there wasn't terrified... When Xavier Rhodes was, well, grabbing his wrist multiple times throughout the game. Severe, severe pain in Xavier Rhodes' wrist, which is, of course, a big bummer for us. But to see Josh Robinson on Calvin Johnson, I mean, who who isn't terrified with that? I mean, he's already short as it is. And then you're going to go against Megatron? Yet Megatron did not torch the Vikings today. No. The Vikings defense still got the job done. Harrison Smith on the uh, on the spot at a, at a point where it looked like Xavier Rhodes actually could have been burned by Megatron, but the fact that uh, Stafford threw the ball poorly and that uh, Harrison Smith was in the right spot at the same time to help out Xavier Rhodes that helped as well. I mean, the secondary has definitely been a wonderful story for the Minnesota Vikings this season. There have been, they have had games that that didn't look too good, and of course the Chicago Bears game was terrible. Without a doubt, that was the one game where they give up 300 yards, and of all people, Jay Cutler torches the Vikings secondary. That figures. But for the most part, the secondary has been a huge strength for the Minnesota Vikings. The secondary has been a huge strength. That's insane that I'm actually able to say that. <laughs> I'm happy to be able to say that. It's wonderful. In fact, we haven't really been able to say that since the Orlando Thomas days before before he had an ACL injury. After he had an ACL injury, the secondary sucked. <laughs> and it sucked forever until pretty much now. <laughs> With the exception of like one or two good years here and there when the Vikings had uh, Antoine Winfield. There were a couple of good years in there, but at the same time, there were, there, were day, there were years where the secondary was torched on a regular basis. Cordero Patterson actually was able to return a 51-yard uh, kick, <laughs> kick return, 51-yard kick return for Gordero Patterson late in the game, all for not though, because the Vikings offense was pretty much out of sync, something something just wasn't right at the end there, I have no idea really what, what to say about it, it was a complete mess, I saw Teddy Bridgewater throwing his hands up, looked extremely frustrated, and then I saw Norv Turner take off his headset and just set it down, and then kind of put it back on. You could tell he was upset. Vikings obviously were, at that point, were called for a uh, delay of game. I wouldn't call it lack of urgency. It just looked like a complete mess. I don't know what to say about that. 
I have no idea what the problem was there. Maybe somebody could fill me in with that one, but it just seemed like a complete lack of communication. No, they weren't on the same page. And next thing you know, (laughs) Vikings offense really couldn't do anything when it mattered most. And that was a huge disappointment when you consider how sharp it was early on in the game. A huge story of the game as well. Blair Walsh, well, he was over three in his field goal attempts. One of them was blocked. One of them was 68 yards, and the other was 53. But at the end of the day, they, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's on the offensive line protecting Blair Walsh in the block kick. It's on Blair Walsh to make the 53 yarder, and well, it was the, on the offense to get a little bit better field position for Blair Walsh on the last play of the game. At any at any rate, it was just a very disappointing game at the end. And really the whole second half, it just kind of lulled us all into a this isn't going to work out type of mode. It kind of lulled us into a football depression, per se. Is that the kind of thing you want to say? Football depression? (laughs) That might be why I sound a little bit strange right now. (laughs) Because I'm just kind of like, I'm just scratching my head like, what the hell happened out there? The Vikings look so good, and then absolutely nothing really to say after that. When the defense plays as well as it does, and of course the offense starts as well as it does, and the Lions look so shell-shocked, their offense looked like a whole lot of nothing, and their defense was getting beat. You got to finish the job in a situation like that. You can't just let the whole game change like that, and the Lions kind of t- change the whole pace of the game. But unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. All due to the interceptions thrown by Teddy Bridgewater and the lack of just. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it's just weird how somebody can go from so good to next thing you know. He's a, he just badly overthrows the guy, and then that's what he does the rest of the game. Badly overthrowing. <laughs> badly overthrowing Charles Johnson for the most part. Time and time again. Badly overthrowing uh, Kyle Rudolph. I don't know what there was on a fourth down play to Cordell Patterson. I don't know what happened there. I mean, Patterson was on the ground, next thing you know. Yeah, it's just a big joke. Just a big joke, big disappointment. Huge disappointment for the Vikings today. Again, the game didn't mean anything for this season, ultimately. But it's a nice confidence booster for us fans who want to see a team that's going to be good next season. A nice confidence booster for Teddy Bridgewater, who looks like to be taking steps in the right direction more and more. Again, huge numbers today. Huge numbers. But those interceptions are, well, they <laughs> they change the pace of the whole game. And that's football for you. That should be the other... <laughs> That should be like a subtitle for the show. That's football. Because that's exactly what it is. You throw a big turnover like that, it changes the whole pace of the game. Especially, especially, especially a divisional game on the road. What more is there to say about this one? I don't know. I'm going to let you guys talk about it in the fan interaction. I mean, I just... Uh, do I even really want to continue? Yeah, I guess I have to a little bit. Third down efficiency. D- Detroit only 2 of 11. Again, you got to win a game like that. Only 2 of 11 on 3rd down efficiency. They didn't even have to go for a 4th down. The Vikings completed one fourth down due to Teddy Bridgewater's nice run. That's another thing that we can mention, is that Teddy Bridgewater's mobility is is excellent when need be. He, he can get you a 1st down on a 4th and long, or, a, or well, not a 4th and long, but a 4th and short. Maybe a 4th and long once in a blue moon, or like a 3rd and 8, something like that. I suppose that's a long. <laughs> he's, he's gotten a few of those. That big 16-yard gain on that fourth down was huge down the stretch. Gave the Vikings hope. Unfortunately, again, all for naught. Uh, there were times it looked like the Vikings' rush defense was going to cost us the game, but they got the job done, like I was saying. They got the job done this time around versus uh, earlier in the season against Green Bay, Chicago, teams like that. But um, overall... The Vikings' rush defense, a slightly weaker uh, weaker link than the Vikings' pass defense overall this season, which is, again, very hard to believe, considering the Vikings' rush defense in the past was always uh, like one of the top in the league, and their pass defense was a huge Achilles heel for the Minnesota Vikings historically the last 10-plus years. But, uh, hey, I mean, I, <laughs> we held them pretty good today. Joyk Bell's longest run of the day. In fact, the longest run of the entire day by the Detroit Lions, only 15 yards, and Reggie Bush rendered useless along the way. So that's the good part. 
ultimately for the Minnesota Vikings defense. It looks really, really, really damn good, to be quite honest with you. Uh, again, no turnovers by Detroit, though. Huge key right there. If Matthew Stafford throws a single interception in this game, the Vikings probably win. If the Vikings recover a single fumble from Detroit, they probably win the game. But there it is. Take care of the football. Please take care of the football. I mean, yeah, that would be great. Vikings dominated in a lot of statistics today, which, again, just breaks your heart. Total yards, 360 for the Vikings, 233 for Detroit. 21 first downs to Detroit's 11. Time of possession, Minnesota leads in all by almost 10 minutes in the time of possession. That is huge on the road. Just just huge. 30, 34, 43 to 25, 17. Almost a 10 minute difference. Another massive uh, massive thing as well. The offensive line not getting the job done for the Minnesota Vikings at times again. They, they were good at times though, so I, I, I gotta give them some credit. They did give Bridgewater time occasionally. <laughs> occasionally at big moments actually. Where Bridgewater had a chance to make a play and he overthrew somebody. So that's the frustration, but yeah, another key stat here that really helped Detroit's cause Minnesota zero sacks, no sacks, and Matthew Stafford. That didn't help. Didn't pin the uh, didn't pin the Lions back. Didn't get the Vikings the ball back late in the game. Just, you know, wouldn't that have been nice with with more time? Maybe that would have been nice. Unfortunately, we only had 50 seconds to work with, though that should be enough for a quarterback when they're sharp. But yeah, Teddy Bridgewater sacked four times. Felt like a thousand though. I mean, he was constantly hurried all, all, uh, here. You know, most of the game. Dominican Sue with a sack. It felt like more than one, but <laughs> he did get one sack. Jason Jones got a sack. George Johnson with a sack. And Devin Taylor with a sack for Detroit. Not that it really matters. Don't really need to name off names because who cares? I guess Dominican Sue just might be playing his last home game for Detroit. Barring some type of, uh, well, some type of contract that they can come up with with Detroit. A money issue. Money talks and all that good stuff. Will Will, will Atlanta reach in and grab Dominican Sue away from Detroit? Sebastian Ball seems to think so. At the end of the day, hey, <laughs> that's fine with me. I'm sick of Dominican Sue dominating us <laughs> every time we play the Detroit Lions. If they lose Dominican Sue, that's a pretty pretty big loss because at least at least he stayed in check this year for the most part with his behavior, for the most part. So good for him there. Ultimately, I'm going to wrap up this game review before I drag it out too far. I said what I needed to say. Now I'm going to let you guys say what you're going to say in the fan interaction part. Let's get on to segment number two, NFC North Roundup and, well, the Miami Dolphins preview coming up next week. Ah, winter and snow are back again. Nothing tastes better this time of year than Vanilla Bean Buffalo Sweat by Tall Grass Beer from Manhattan, Kansas. This vanilla bean edition of Buffalo Sweat literally warms your innards in this outstanding stout with that warming vanilla kick. Don't forget to try 8-Bit Pale Ale, the official beer of this podcast. When you see Pac-Man licking his chops, you found an amazing can and an even better beer. Check out the many other wonderful beers Tallgrass offers on their website at www.tallgrassbeer.com. Use their beer locator to see what's available in your area. You can follow Tallgrass on Twitter at TallgrassMN, and like them on Facebook. Simply search for Tallgrass Minnesota. Tallgrass Beer, bringing people together over a beer since 2007. Too busy to sit in front of a computer? Simply download Purple Mafia on iTunes for Apple devices. For Android, download the Double Twist app, and for Windows and BlackBerry phones, Simply find us in the store. And now, back to Paladino Joey. And we are back here on Purple Mafia. It is time for the NFC North Roundup. And of course, the Miami Dolphins preview coming up next week. Thankfully, not a late game this time around. (laughs) Not sure what all of you thought about the late game this time around. Not a big fan of it. But then again, it just is what it is. What are you going to do? I mean, seriously, what are you going to do? Let's talk about the invincible Green Bay Packers and the quarterback that's incapable of having a bad game, ever. He, he, he just, there's no way Aaron Rodgers would ever have a bad game, ever. There's just no way. Unless, of course, it's the New York Giants. Oh, well, maybe it's not just the New York Giants, maybe it's the, the state of New York, huh? 
because in Ralph Wilson Stadium, home of the Buffalo Bills, the team that probably, in a lot of ways, killed the Minnesota Vikings' chances of making the postseason this year, and it definitely were some uh, baby steps backwards in that game, I would say. Vikings losing by one point in that one, <laughs> losing at the last second, Bridgewater having a tough go, of course, because of the Buffalo defensive line frustrating the hell out of Teddy Bridgewater and the Minnesota Vikings offense in general. Well, guess what? The Buffalo Bills defensive line and their overall defense in general <laughs> frustrated the living hell out of the Green Bay Packers today. A 21-13 to victory for the Buffalo Bills over the Green Bay Packers, keeping the Buffalo Bills playoff hopes very much alive. They have ensured themselves of their first non-losing season in quite a long time. I mean, a really, really long time since the Buffalo Bills were in the postseason or had a winning record. So there you go. Green Bay Packers 10-4, and four, and guess what? They're in second place because, uh, well, <laughs> the Detroit Lions beat the Packers earlier this year. We're going to be heading to Lambeau Field for the season finale, in the whole, which could be a division championship type of game between those two. Maybe the Vikings cost the Green Bay Packers home field advantage this season. Who knows? Uh, I just hope Seattle doesn't get it. That's what I'm concerned with. I'll get to that in a second here, as that will be an ongoing uh, talker throughout this segment. In fact, I'll probably get to that before I talk about the Miami Dolphins game with the Minnesota Vikings. They didn't look good today. <laughs> uh huh. Aaron Rodgers. Let's look at this. Let's let's just take a look at this right now. Okay, let's look at the other quarterback first, just because I'm just a big jerk, right? I like to tease you. Uh, Kyle Orton, who didn't look all so good against the Minnesota Vikings, didn't look very good against the Green Bay Packers either. No touchdowns, an interception, quarterback rating 54.2. Only, I mean, under 52% completion percentage, only 158 yards overall. Yeah, he was sacked three times. Aaron Rodgers was only sacked once. Only sacked once. You would have thought that the Packers might have done okay. if I mean, at least they didn't sack Rodgers too much. Yeah, but they frustrated the living crap out of him and kicked his ass the whole game. Aaron Rodgers attempted 42 passes, completed 17 of them, 40% completion percentage, no touchdowns, two interceptions. Are you ready for this, folks? Are you ready? <laughs> Quarterback rating, 34.3. Ha ha. Gotta love that. <laughs> How can you not love it? I don't want to hear I don't want to hear any more local radio people talking about, oh, I love Aaron Rodgers. I gotta watch him. Yeah, great. I'm glad you love him and I'm glad you want to watch him. Okay, sure. If you're a football fan, he's fun to watch to a point. And I got that way with Brett Favre of the Green Bay Packers. I'm just not there yet with, with Aaron Rodgers. I'm, you know what I mean? I'm just not there yet. He's too, eh, you know, he's too brash, too cocky. He's kind of like Kobe Bryant in the late, you know, when he was in his late twenties. You know, you still, it was hard to root for for him. When Aaron Rodgers gets a little bit older, maybe I'll soften on him. I'm just not there yet. Sorry, I'm not. <laughs> yes, he's very good. Yes, I can acknowledge that with full confidence. Yes, the Green Bay Packers are Super Bowl contenders. Yes, I picked them to win the division this year. And yes, I just might end up have them <laughs> going all the way this year, but we're not quite at that point yet. Again, me and Dylan Richardson will be discussing that in the not-too-distant future. Um, I might as well mention this in-studio monitor, in-studio television, we'll say. Kobe Bryant has uh, eclipsed Michael Jordan for the third all-time leading scorer uh, in total points in, in NBA history, so there it is. Kobe Bryant, now the third all-time leading scorer in NBA history. We'll be talking about that in Timberwolves Explosion and Showtime and T-Wolves in the future. Apologize for the extreme delay on those shows. Again, my schedule sucks. It sucks. Yeah, I'm just glad to be getting this show out, but I will be getting Timberwolves Explosion out more soon here, but unfortunately probably will be solo due to extreme schedule constraints for Mr. Marcus the Forecaster. Eddie Lacy, by the way, his, uh, and yes, Marcus the Forecaster is a Packer fan, unfortunately. He is from Wisconsin. <laughs> um, Eddie Lacy, 97 yards on the ground, 6.5 a carry. It's a, hey, nice, nice running game for Green Bay. Who'd have thunk the passing game would struggle as much as it did? But that Buffalo defense, folks, is legit. <laughs> it's the real deal. Um, <laughs> not only did it frustrate the crap out of the Vikings and pretty much make us borderline useless throughout the whole game, it made the Packers borderline useless throughout the whole game. 13 points for the Packers? Really? Yep. I mean, what, what more is there to say? 
this was not a fun game to watch either. Oh no. And yes, this is the game before the Minnesota Vikings game. It was basically just field goals the whole game for the (laughs) Buffalo Bills. And yes, the special teams contributed along the way, which set the tone for the rest of the way. Marcus Thigpen returning a 75-yard punt ultimately got the Buffalo Bills up 7-3 after a Mason Crosby field goal. Yeah, a 45-yarder midway or so, or late in the first quarter, we'll say. But then Buffalo kind of took over from there. Yes, Eddie Lacy did put the Packers back ahead, finishing a drive. <laughs> Early in the second quarter, put the Packers ahead, but then after that, it was just kick, 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 kick. It was just, that's all it was. It was the it was the UFC man. It was the UFC Ultimate Football Challenge of of field goals <laughs> for field goal kickers. Dan Carpenter with gosh with four field goals. Mason Crosby two on the day. Ultimately felt like a million though from Mason Crosby. Oh, and then Aaron Rodgers also fumbled the ball, and Eddie Lacy recovered the fumble for no gain. Yeah, but Aaron Rodgers ultimately coughed up a safety in this one. Or on that play, ultimately. So the score didn't look as weird as, as it could have because of the but with the safety because there were so many field goals in the game. Buffalo was up nineteen to three at that point, but that right there, when Aaron Rodgers ended up having to, uh, well, when when Aaron Rodgers was quote unquote awarded with a safety, that was all she wrote because Buffalo then got the ball back and well they ran the clock out and that was pretty sweet to see. Gotta like this. Gotta like that. I mean, Aaron Rodgers just it wasn't his day. It wasn't the Packers' day, and it does show that this team is very beatable. Um, not saying that they're beatable necessarily, but if you have a good defensive line, a lot of the New York Giants in the past, like they did against the Packers and they did they did against the Patriots in the past. That's how you beat a great quarterback is have a great defensive line <laughs> who is better than that. <laughs> who like the the defensive line is better than that team's offensive line. You got a chance to beat anybody. You can win a Super Bowl at that point. Not saying Buffalo's going to win a Super Bowl, but yeah, well, who knows? Who picked the New York Giants to beat the 16 and 0 Patriots in? Uh, I almost called it 1997, 2007. Nobody. Who picked them to win in 2012? Nobody. 2011. Pardon me. But again, nobody. Nobody. Are, are you kidding? Who picked the Giants to beat the Packers in Lambeau Field when they were 15 and 1? Nobody. Would the Buffalo Bills have beaten the Packers in Lambeau Field today? Yes, <laughs> yes. If if they played this way, yes. <laughs> so there it is. I mean, it's all there is to it. You don't have to have this, the greatest team ever. The one difference, though, I would have to say between this Buffalo team and that New York Giants team, Kyle Orton versus Eli Manning. Yeah, Eli Manning probably going to get the job done more than Kyle Orton would. But again, point made. Defensive lines are probably... <laughs> Defensive lines are as important as it gets when it comes to postseason football. If you're going to beat, if, if, if you're going to beat a great team with a great quarterback, it can happen, and it has happened before, and it will happen again. So watch out, folks. Watch out. Not saying anything on the Buffalo Bills, but just saying Green Bay is not <laughs> Green Bay and New England, and definitely Denver are not <laughs> invincible. And I pray to God Seattle isn't invincible either. But oh, I don't want them to win. Well, that wraps up the NFC North again because the Chicago Bears play tomorrow and I just, I can't delay this show tomorrow. And how many of you right now are worried about the Chicago Bears at this point? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, they did win last week, which was nice for them. They're now 5-8. and eight. The Vikings are 6-8. and eight. <laughs> We'll see what the Chicago Bears do tomorrow. I kind of think that they, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they won. They do host the game. That's the good part. But it is the New Orleans Saints, who they also won recently, believe it or not. That division is still up in the air. Atlanta lost recently. Carolina won again today. Congratulations to Carolina. They just might win that division. Um, And again, our thoughts and prayers all the way with Cam Newton. Really, really liked what he had to say when he said that, uh, you know, God was looking out for him. Really, really liked what he had to say there. I'm uh, completely in uh, agreement and... (laughs) A big fat thumbs up, you know, like clicking like on that comment per se a million times if this was a Facebook page right now. (laughs) We'll stay there. Um, But yeah, Chicago, New Orleans, there is some playoff implications to that game, in that game on the New Orleans side. Chicago and Minnesota, dead. (laughs) Six feet under for the season, but still you got to play out the games. And Chicago's side of things, well, whatever. I don't 
really feel confident if I'm a Bears fan right now. Jay Cutler's nuts. The coach doesn't seem to have control of that team. And their defense is horrible. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad for the Bears fans right now, including Dylan Richardson. So I have a soft spot for the Bears, partially because of Dylan Richardson and because I hate the Lions and Packers. So I guess Chicago got the soft spot out of the other teams in the division. Arizona, a team I definitely definitely have a soft spot for, especially with Carson Palmer's injury and now Drew Stanton's injury. What the hell? They win. They win twelve to six over St. Louis on Thursday. Very happy about that. They're eleven and three. They're very likely going to be in the playoffs now. Not sure where they're going to go from there. There was even rumors about Kurt Warner coming back. That that would have been sweet. I mean, man, could you imagine if Kurt Warner was actually good right now and he signed and he was able to sign with that team with that defense? You have a quarterback that's that good. You still have you still have Larry Fitzgerald, not as great as he was before, but man, whew, imagine that. Wouldn't that be something? Cleveland's dead, and uh, I feel really happy about the Minnesota Vikings taking a uh, Teddy Bridgewater over Johnny Manziel at least early on. Manziel did a whole lot of nothing. Cincinnati, Zimmer's old club, 30. Cleveland, zip. Really sorry um, to... Really sorry for you, though. Uh, Vince Germano out there, Cleveland Browns fan, Lakers fan, and, of course, co-host of mine on Showtime and T-Wolves, and, of course, also co-host of the great Courtside Podcast with Hank McCoy from Australia. Great show there. Um... But ultimately, yeah, San Francisco is dead. Seattle is winning 17-7, to or has won 17-7 to in Seattle. That's where I'm going to wrap up this review with, or this, this segment with right there, before I talk about the uh, Vikings and Dolphins. But um, Seattle. <laughs> the biggest key here right now <laughs> is just pray to God Seattle does not get home field advantage, because if they do, they're going to the Super Bowl again. And I would really hate that with a passion. Those of you out there that like Seattle, I have no idea why, other than you're just bandwagon. <laughs> because nobody gave a rat's ass about Seattle just three years ago. Seriously, nobody cared about that team three years ago. Be honest. Tell the truth. Seriously. 17-7, San Francisco is officially beyond dead, as <laughs> if they weren't already. Um, Jim Harbaugh is on his way out, and I think that sucks. Uh, I'm not sure where he's going to wind up. He, unfortunately, he is one of those coaches that does have a, uh, there, there's a timer on him, and unfortunately, that time is dinging. The timer is ringing, and it's it's over, so that sucks. Seattle gets home field advantage, it's over, though. They're going to the Super Bowl again, and that would really suck, as far as I'm concerned. So there you go. That's where I hope, like, someone else can take that away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I really would have, I really would appreciate that if that were the case. But they're now 10-4 and four to go with Detroit and Green Bay, and possibly Philadelphia, who will be flashing on the screen here momentarily against Dallas. That's a pretty important game right there. One of those teams is also going to be 10-4. and four. So, home field advantage. It's going to be a logjam in the NFC. It's going to be very interesting. I actually would like to see Philadelphia, if, <laughs> if not Arizona, ultimately. They actually are the leaders for home field advantage. Pardon me, but I just am not as confident in them as these other teams. <laughs> <laughs> New England is also eleven and three. They are got they they have got to be the favorites in the AFC right now. Forty one to thirteen over the Miami Dolphins. I'm finally getting to, and I do apologize for my yammering, but I, I really, you know, I mean, I like keeping up with the with the whole league. I like uh, bringing it up. Heck, it's something to look forward to. Come up, I mean, you no, know, coming January, what to look forward to? Who's going to be what here? And Unfortunately, in a lot of ways, certain coaches are going to be let go, and certain situations are really, uh, you know, snowballing into what they are, like San Francisco. Miami Dolphins might be snowballing into a team that's not going to make the playoffs and fire their coach as well. I think Joe Philbin's been okay. I mean, it's turning out to be very disappointing, and the Patriots, again, rolling over them today. 41-13, not a good sample size of the Miami Dolphins here, considering, well, for one, considering that they are... In Miami next week against the Minnesota Vikings. Again, a noon game. Thank God for that. It's a home game for the Miami Dolphins. And they've had an okay season. Ryan Tannehill, again, has been solid this year. 22 touchdowns, 11 interceptions on the season. Well over 3,000 yards. In fact, about 3,300 yards on the year. He's had a nice year. Lamar Miller and the running game, above average. Definitely above average. Ryan Tannehill's actually pretty mobile, too. With 300 yards on the ground. I don't really think about Ryan Tannehill's mobility, to be quite honest, but it's it's there. That's something to fear. 
Mike Wallace is what he is, the leading receiver in yards, but not in catches. 700 yards on the year. Seven touchdowns. Jarvis Landry is another wide receiver on that team with uh, five touchdowns, almost 600 yards on the season. The leading receiver, per se, more of a slot receiver type versus what Mike Wallace is, an overall explosive uh, wide out and possible deep threat. Not as explosive as he was at the Pittsburgh Pirates. No, I'm kidding. The Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> I had to say it. Pittsburgh Steelers over the years in the past. Definitely uh, an expensive contract, though, with the Miami Dolphins. Really overspent for him for what they're getting. You know, this is a classic type of team where they're decent. They should at least be a 9-7, and seven, maybe 10-6 and first-round type of team in the postseason. They have a pretty solid defense, though, unfortunately, you could call it an inc- inconsistent defense. I mean, they've given up, they, they gave up 34 points against the Kansas City Chiefs early in the year. Uh, then they shut out the San Diego Chargers. I mean, go figure. One other trend, though, the Miami Dolphins, pretty good at home. I mean, they barely lost to the Green Bay Packers earlier in the season. On the road, well, they're kind of hit and miss, per se. I guess the biggest, yeah, their worst game of the season is against the Chiefs. At home, Miami Dolphins throttled. 34-15 at home against the Kansas City Chiefs. That was not a good one. Um, but, yeah, I mean, on the road, they haven't had much success. They got beat pretty bad by Buffalo. They actually beat the uh, Patriots really early back in week one. <laughs> a lot of us thought the Patriots were done. Um, uh, well, they beat Jacksonville and Chicago. Okay, oh, goody. Um, but on the road, Miami, uh, Miami definitely not as successful as at home overall. And then they've kind of taken a dip the past few weeks here. Only scoring 16 points against the Jets. 13 points against the Baltimore Ravens. And then again, 13 points against the New England Patriots this week. While giving up, well, 28 to Baltimore and 41 today to the New England Patriots. Dolphins definitely on the snide right now. That might be, well, that might give the Vikings an opportunity to possibly get a a uh, spo- uh, season-ending type of win for us, per se. It'll get us our seventh win on the season. Uh, ball uh, Has Miami just given up on their coach and given up on the season? Are they in pout mode right now? Possibly. Uh, a, a game like today would make you think that. Again, a road game, though. They, do, they don't play very well on the road. They play better at home, but then again, almost everybody does. I can't right now, off the top of my head, remember the last time the Vikings won in Miami. I I may dig that up at some point, if possible. Miami's defense is decent, but again, inconsistent. They have, uh, I mean, they have have, uh, uh, Grimes has five interceptions on the season. Wake has nine and a half sacks. So they have players that can play a little bit. Cameron Wake, that is. Um, Oliver Vernon has six and a half sacks on the season. So they do have a pass rush, obviously. Several sacks up and down the, the lineup. But those were the main guys. But nobody overall stands out like, oh my god, this is going to be a deadly team. But then again, if I were to pick one player that is the star of this defense, it is Brent Grimes. I mean, he's deflected 13 passes, 5 interceptions, and he does have a pick 6 on the season as well. So again, that's definitely the guy when it comes to the Miami Dolphins and their defense. But at the same time, again, are they just in pout mode right now? Or are they still... (laughs) Are they still going to be legit out there? This, of course, is a left cornerback, Brain Grimes. Undrafted, too, many uh, years ago. I remember the Vikings were looking to <laughs> to try to sign him in the offseason. They didn't get him, and he's having a huge year for the Miami Dolphins. He's helped them uh, be competitive this season. I uh, dare I say elite, but no, they're not elite, but they've been competitive, and he's been a reason for that. They have an overall nice group of players, but... It all depends on Teddy Bridgewater again. Teddy Bridgewater was a key today. He would have won the game if he kept playing well. If he stayed sharp. But he didn't. Uh, Walsh is scaring me a little bit. I gotta tell you, Walsh is scaring me right now. Not everything is his fault, but at the same time, when he misses, he misses badly. Uh, That 53-yard kick was terrible. And in in the past, he would have made that kick. It it was indoors, by the way. Yeah, it's on the road, but it's indoors. Don't kickers love indoors? <laughs> yeah, don't they love kicking indoors? Isn't that usually a lot easier for them to make like a long one like that? He's done it before. It, it just seems like something's off right now with Blair Walsh, and it's extremely frustrating. That's another thing that scares me on the road against the Miami Dolphins. 
because we're going to need field goals against this against this pretty good defense and decent offense. Ultimately, how how many points are they going to score against the Vikings defense? That's going to be the deal right there. That's I think going to be the Dolphins undoing ultimately. A lot of that depends on if I try not to cough to death. <laughs> a lot of that depends on Ryan Tannehill ultimately, because the Vikings defense has been extremely good of late again. And it's been really good all year for the most part, with the exception of that Chicago Bears game and, of course, the New England Patriots game when we got carved up. And the Packer game was like the biggest throwout of all time. It's like nobody showed up for that one. <laughs> okay, how, how many Nick? Yeah, how, how many more games do I got to name here now that the that I'm that, I, that the Vikings defense didn't play well, right? But no, they've been playing defense very well recently, and I could see them keeping the Miami Dolphins in check next week. That's where I think the Vikings could win the game. It's mostly because of our defense and hopefully that Teddy Bridgewater can shake off some of those, can shake off what what took place in that second quarter today. That really, really messed with him. And that's the first time I've really seen Bridgewater flustered. I, I haven't seen Teddy Bridgewater flustered thus far this year. Today, it seemed like he took a step back a little bit after that. After it looked like, again, he was taking mammoth steps forward. He looked unbelievably good. And then all of a sudden, you know, just all of a sudden, bam, that interception led to another one and then a lot of poor passes along the way. The Vikings defense and Teddy Bridgewater are the keys in this game, without a doubt. <laughs> you think I'm going to come on here and say Ben Tate and Matt Asiata are the keys to, to this game? I don't know. It's going to be Xavier Rhodes, especially, you know, knocking down passes and hopefully his health with his wrist, hopefully, uh, you know, stopping Ryan Tannehill in the uh, pretty pretty good Miami passing game again three thousand yards on the season. I mean that's that's not elite, but it's better than some some guys out there. Mike Wallace, obviously a very good receiver, but I think I think Xavier Rhodes can help cancel him out. I mean even Kelvin Johnson didn't have a great game today. That's where I think the Vikings can and and will win the football game in Miami. I think Miami is in pow mode, and I think the Vikings are in a mode right now. They want to build confidence. So I do have the Vikings winning in Miami next week, believe it or not. And they will finish, they will have, well, they will get to a 7-8 and eight record and then hope to finish with 8-8, eight and eight, which they originally predicted, or possibly 7-9. and nine, Though I think this is shaping up to an 8-8 eight and eight finish for the Minnesota Vikings, which is a nice building block to the future. Because I do think the Vikings beat Chicago in DCF in advance right now. I, I am picking that, but we'll get to that next week. I think it's going to be one of those games again. It's going to be black and blue. It's going to be grinded out. Miami's defense is fairly decent. Minnesota's defense is very good. So I think the Minnesota Vikings win something like 24 to... I think Minnesota wins 24 to... to I, I think we keep Miami down to like... Uh, you know, they've scored 13 two weeks in a row, but we'll make it 14. <laughs> No, 17. I'm going to... No, no, 14. I'm going to... 24-14, Minnesota wins in Miami in a really nice game. I think Teddy Bridgewater does bounce back, and I think Xavier Rhodes, and, you know, obviously Harry the Hitman, as we like to call him, and guys like Hodges go out there and get the job done. And I think the Vikings win 24-14 next week in Miami and get to 7-8 and eight and ultimately lead to 8-8. Eight and eight. And I think the Dolphins finish something 7-9 and nine or 8-8. Eight and eight as well. So that'll be my preview again for this one. It's all about Bridgewater <laughs> and of course the Xavier Rose on the other side of uh, of the ball. And of course, <clears throat> well of course, <laughs> Everson Griffin possibly getting a sack. Hopefully the Vikings get a sack next week because they didn't get any today. That would have made a huge difference. That's another key. Got to get to Ryan Tannehill this time around because he does have some mobility, believe it or not. There it is. We'll be back. Fan interaction right after this. Do you shop on Amazon? Did you know that you can support this podcast just by doing your normal shopping on Amazon? It's really easy to do. Just go to thesportstuff.com and click on one of the many Amazon pictures. Do your normal shopping, and Amazon sees that we referred you, and they give us a percentage. We'd like to thank you in advance for supporting thesportstuff.com, and please use our Amazon link. Now enjoy the rest of the show. 
Contact us and support Purple Mafia by liking us on Facebook and following us on Twitter. Don't forget to call into our phone lines at 209-736-7877. That's 209-736-7877. Hey, Joey, it's Malcolm from Ojai, California. Um, still here, love the show, listen every week. Um, a little fact for you. Every Sunday I watch the, the game with my dad, and it's recorded, so we're usually 30 minutes behind, so I don't get into the in-game stuff because I don't want to know what's going to happen. But as for the Vikings' win today, it wasn't pretty, but it's a W. We already uh, did better than last season without pretty much any pro bowlers on offense. And the fact that Teddy's 5-4 uh, and four as a starter now is looking good. He's... Uh, calling all the bulls out there, showing poise, and just doing something we haven't seen for a while, probably since far. And um, I know we gave up a lot of yards on defense, but we held them in the red zone, caused a couple turnovers. Harrison Smith is a stud. Everson Griffin makes us forget about number 69. And, um, yeah, overall, happy with the season. Anything from here on out, as of a win, it will be icing on the cake. I'm already already happy with the season. All right. Shout out to everybody else out there in Purple Mafia. Love you guys. Bye. And I thank you so much for that call, Malcolm. Love you too, buddy. <laughs> yep. I uh, like that shout out the, at the end. And you noticed he was talking about a win. That was against the New York Jets last week. Um, he made the call right after the game. Yeah, I, I just didn't get the call until a couple, like like a day or two later. So I deeply, deeply apologize. Um, just nothing we can do sometimes. Unfortunately, I, I don't know if Dylan had to go to work or what happened, but or just he didn't see it. Uh, we we apologize for that. Uh, it happens once in a while. So um, still, I'm going to be kind enough to put the call on the following week's show, which is this one. <laughs> um, nice call indeed. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater also with, uh, yeah, yeah, like you were saying, he was 5-4 and four as a starter at the time. Very cool. Uh, calling that audible, that was really key. Showed a lot of poise, and it definitely gave him a lot of confidence going into this week. It's just, it's just too bad what took place after that. And I'm sure you, you know exactly what I'm talking about there. Um, three game-winning drives overall for Teddy Bridgewater at that point. That was his third game-winning drive already for his career. Very cool. Very encouraging signs of the future for this young man. Hopefully today, again, it didn't dash his hopes. Also, it makes sense that, um, yeah, where you're not as, uh, not interacting in the in-game stuff as much because of the 30-minute delay because of recording and you don't want to get spoilers, so to speak. Totally understand that. That would drive me nuts. So, can't blame you for that. Yeah, I mean, and you're always welcome to post in the post-game thoughts, of course. That's where that comes in. And, of course, the call-in. Fantastic. Always love when Malcolm calls in. It's been a while. Malcolm, out of California there. Welcome aboard. So now, a second call from Sebastian Balls, last week's Gold Star winner. You have the floor. Hey, Joey. Uh, it's Sebastian again. And that was pathetic. That sucked. We sucked. Uh Poor game management at the end of the game. The kicker couldn't make a single kick. Our offensive line just was not there. Our defense just could not come up too big. Um, I don't know. I say our defense did okay, but the offense really fell apart. Uh, Teddy had two bad throws. Uh, it is what it is. All right, thanks for letting me call in, and I'll be listening. Hey, thank you for that call, Sebastian, and welcome back again. Very cool to hear you on the phone lines there. Yeah, summed it up pretty good there, pretty good. The only thing I'd have to say, the only thing I'd have to slightly semi-disagree with, there was more than two bad throws, but two really bad throws that cost us. Uh, The second one was a little bit lucky, I think, the interception, but only a little bit. It was more of a great play, per se. The first, yeah, the first one was, was horrible. Um, yeah, there were a lot of overthrows along the way in the, uh, after that. It's just like something happened, and I don't know what it is. Mechanics, something. It's like the, the bad habits started to come back where he started overthrowing guys. And, of course, in other cases, underthrowing him. But he, I don't think he really underthrew anybody today, per se. Lots of overthrowing, believe it or not. Poor game management. Oh, my God. That's 
that was <laughs> what the hell was that? You know, late late in that fourth quarter. Yeah, I mean, like I was talking about in the first segment, <laughs> seeing Teddy Bridgewater throwing his hands up in the air like. I, I don't know if their if their microphone system or you know their their communication system was down or what was going on, but something was wrong. Um, the, something was very bad wrong, and I didn't know what the hell to think of it. And they had the delay of game and everything. It just was a complete joke. They had to call a timeout at one point too, and I could tell uh, at one point earlier in that fourth quarter as well for a very similar situation. Zimmer looked irate several times today. In fact, you know, usually. Uh, as fiery as Zimmer is, he looked angrier today than he has all season, to be quite honest. He looked like he's ready to sock someone's face in. I, I, I don't know if it was circumstances with the electronic equipment or people weren't on the same page. People weren't listening. I have no idea what the hell to make of it. But even Teddy Bridgewater today looked angry for the first time. Usually he looks kind of calm, cool, and, and young, <laughs> per se. He looked furious at times, Teddy Bridgewater, late in that fourth quarter, like he was pissed off about something, he was upset about something, throwing his hands up in the air, getting angry, something was going on, he was even getting annoyed to some of the Detroit players, I think they were talking a lot of you-know-what, uh, particularly on one of his slides, the guy went right for Bridgewater's head, and, and there was a little chatter going on between the two, you could tell Bridgewater was like saying that was BS, basically, basically, I, those, those weren't the words I saw, but there you go. Um, yeah, great call, Sebastian. Great call, Malcolm. Thank you so much. And you guys know how to reach the numbers out there, as you heard in the jingle. And you'll also see it in the information on the podcast on iTunes. So there you go. And, of course, on the thesportstuff.com. So, and I'll just say it now, 209-736-7877. I just don't want to flood my show with, you know, jingles and stuff. But, you know, with, from, from myself. I put the jingles in for a reason. Let's... Uh, Let's get on with things here. There were a couple of posts to the page along the week, per se, and during the game as well. Uh uh-huh. Monday, Robin Sullivan posted a uh, video where Everson Griffin celebrated the overtime win. We appreciate that. And definitely, uh, Sebastian Balls was saying, sick of, yep, here we go. This was this morning. Sick of these 325 games, you know, 325 p.m., I don't give a bleep if we're America's joke of the week. <laughs> bleep these late bleeping games. I don't give a bleep who watches our games across the country. <laughs> we aren't playing Thursday night football, Sunday night football, or Monday night football. Stop putting us in these afternoon games. Bleeping hate these gall dang <laughs> piece of crap scheduling crap. <laughs> Yeah, because if I read the whole thing, holy cow, you'd be like, all right. But you get the idea. He extremely upset about the uh, late games. Yeah, I don't like him either. And it, it just kind of makes the day drag. It's like, okay, let's get on with it here. I don't want to spend my whole day waiting for the game, you know. Let's just get on with it. I, I like noon games more, too. And even my fiance does. I thought she liked the later games better because then we could work out first. But then next thing you know, No. <laughs> no, that didn't actually work out at all. So there you go. All right, Sebastian continuing later in the game. He says, good news and bad news. I've started doing my draft prep and looking at players and maybe seeing if any would be huge, would be a huge add to the Vikings. Bad news, no standout elite offensive lineman. Good news, wouldn't be wasting high picks on any either. Well, all right then. All right then. Yeah, we wouldn't be wasting any high picks. Yeah, um, this is a good one. Yeah. This is a good one by Sebastian. He's a serious star candidate and a serious back-to-back gold star candidate. Serious back-to-back gold star candidate, I might add. Uh, he says, I got an urban, le- an urban legend for you. David Yankee. Remember the guy who had a huge who had huge hype after the draft? Hmm, he hasn't even drafted this year. Dressed this year, even with all the injuries. That's awesome, Sebastian. He was such an urban legend. I... Just about forgot about him. I mean, I almost forgot about David Yankee. Almost. So, there you go. That's the Urban Legend of the Week. It is. Because Cordell Patterson caught a pass today. I I didn't even talk about it because I just... ah. I mean, I was more focused on the outcome of the game than just like Cordero this and Cordero that. Yes, Matt Khalil got called for a penalty. And there were some gaffes on the uh, offensive line, but they weren't all his. Just the offensive line in general needs help. 
You know, I mean, it's not all Matt Khalil. And yes, he's extremely disappointing, but so are other players. And Sullivan's this and this guy's that. Sebastian continuing saying no one deserves the Fran Tarkinen Award. Everyone deserves the T-Jack Award. Believe it or not, I have choices for both Fran Tarkinen and T-Jack. So not all the way in on that one, but I totally understand your frustration. Oh, yeah. Um, Sebastian wrapping the uh, separate posts up with nobody in their right mind will think we don't have room to build after this dismal year. Oh, of course we have room to build. I totally agree. But the good news is it's it's not like last season where there were so many holes that it's like, you know, pick your, you know, just just name anything pretty much and it'll be an improvement. At least, at least it's not like the secondary is inept and useless like it was last year. With most of the same players, it was coaching. It's proof that uh, both Zimmer and Williams were garbage. Or, what am I talking about? Zimmer, excuse me. See, I'm losing my mind here, and I think you guys are getting annoyed. And I know Sebastian is. I know he is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Zimmer's garbage. Yeah, right. Zimmer's defense is fantastic. He's the reason why it's improved. But, um, yeah, Williams last year, and, of course, Leslie Frazier, who I'm losing my mind just thinking about. I'm losing my mind because of the game today, and I'm losing my mind because how bad Leslie Frazier was. Nobody commented on the... Don't forget to check out the show, but they did comment on the Flight 17 part. Very cool post here that I think Mike Smart Carlson is a star candidate along the way. He says, thank you, Joey Wygen. Your hard work is appreciated. I am downloading now and looking forward to listening tomorrow. This post absolutely is a star candidate, without a doubt. And he's going to be one of the stars, like almost 99% chance here. Beautiful picture, really. <laughs> and you know, a lot of us are annoyed as hell when people post pictures of food on Facebook, food or drinks or whatever on Facebook. But this is different because he's got the 8 bit there. And you know what? I like, the, you know, it's a nice combination of food with the 8 bit too. And it just shows how loyal Mark Carlson is and how, hey, <laughs> hey, tall grass out there, hey, you know what? My ads are working. Because people are buying your your product, and there it is, right there in HD quality, <laughs> in a, on a HD quality picture, in a nice mug, eight bit, beautiful, placed, beautifully placed in the picture, right there with the Pac Man licking his chops. <laughs> Let's read what Mark had to say though before I ramble on too much. Uh, he says, "Great show, Joey Wygen. I enjoyed another collector's edition of the Purple Mafia podcast today. The game sure had me on the edge of my seat." That was fun, but as you said, we played them way too close. This, of course, is the Jets game. I'm celebrating tonight with a special meal and an 8-bit hopped up. And yes, there are hops in 8-bit. So if you're not a big fan of hops, you probably have to go with the pub ale from Tallgrass. Or in the summer, Halcyon is definitely uh, not a hoppy beer, but 8-bit is. Um, he says, just like this team's play and the podcast, Skull Vikings Mark from Iowa, star candidate without a doubt. And, yeah, this generates some thoughts. Uh, Adrian Peterson's appeal was denied, and I saved it all the way for segment three because, you know what, it's old news now. The whole Adrian Peterson thing is old news. Yet, obviously, his denial isn't old news, and I gave you guys the floor rather than myself the floor. And here you guys go. (laughs) Tene Brown out of New Zealand, and, of course, a nice follower of Timberwolves Explosion. In fact, probably the gold star king of that show. (laughs) In fact, I know he is. Him, uh, if not, well, him and Vince Germano per se. Uh, he says he hasn't been, hasn't he been punished by the courts already? He should be allowed to play. I don't think he'll, he'd be physically ready to play though. Anyway, just my opinion. Um, he probably well. I mean, his timing would probably be bad. Yeah, I think his timing would be off, but I think physically he'd be okay. Hmm. Uh, but then again. I guess we'll never know at this point. We won't know till next year, and he better be ready then. <laughs> Patrick Grant saying crock of shit. There, I said it. Ray Rice was reinstated. AP should be as well. Goodell is an ass. Yeah, I'm on Patrick's side there. Um, Robin Sullivan posting a picture. You know those Facebook pictures where you have the text in them? Uh, someone should beat the shit out of me. <laughs> That's Roger Goodell, of course, in the, in the picture. Josh Mayer Henry saying... The guy in charge of the appeal is in Goodell's pocket. Yep, good point. I've seen this coming when he was put in charge of Yeah, but now it's going to be heard by federal court. So we'll see. Robin Sullivan saying it's BS. As I said before, he's been punished enough by the courts, media, sponsors, loss of fans. Yep. Mark Carlson with interesting comments here saying, Well, guys, 
what league what league wants the world to know what the league wants to know is that it has high standards for personal conduct on and off the field. Unfortunately, our greatest running back, quote-unquote, ever, is caught up in the making of these strict rules. As a fan, I'm disappointed. As a parent, I understand. I am ready for him to suit up next year. I want him back. Interesting stuff, and uh, well said, Mark. Well said. Yep. Um, yeah, definitely well said. Cedric Taylor, Cedric Taylor made, <laughs> saying... I hope he sues their asses. Mm -hmm. And I think he will, or at least he's going to attempt to. Gerald Sring saying, I'm not 100% sure we know all the details of what actually happened, but pretty sure there's a lot of politics and pressure for the NFL NFL to crack down on the personal conduct policy. And unfortunately, AP is going to take the brunt of them making an example. Just hope we can put this in the past during the offseason and move on and get AP back on the field next season. Yeah, yeah. Star candidate, um, mm, yeah, <sighs> politics, they just ruin everything, don't they? Ugh. And I won't get into it, you guys probably see too much of me ranting on Facebook at times about stuff, but anyhow, Brent Jacobson saying, I'm surprised but not shocked, I really didn't want him to play this year, I really didn't want him to play this year, hmm, partially because you wanted to see McKinnon, but now, well, yeah, no, yeah, you know, um, and then the end game, 121 comments, lots of, lots of on and on rants and and uh, raves throughout the game, mostly rants after the first uh, after those two awesome touchdowns. Lots of frustration after that, and um, it kind of is what it is. If you're curious, check that out if you want. Post game thoughts. Here's <laughs> it showed five. There's a hell of a lot more than that, which is a good thing. Sebastian simply saying he called in, and that Zimmer will be irate. Patrick Grant, welcome back again. He's been posting lately, and I appreciate it. Keep posting. Hopefully, you're a listener. Um, he says, if Blair Walsh makes either of those two field goals, we win. Yeah. Yep, it's that simple. Especially, well, yeah, I mean, if the line blocked enough, that was a line collapse. If the line blocked enough for him, 23-yard, we won the game right there. And the 53-yard are indoors. I mean, it's not an easy kick or anything, but, you know, he made that before. And it was missed pretty badly. It was an ugly kick. Ugly kick. Uh, Chris... Crystal Livingston, huh? That's a new one. I, uh, welcome aboard, Crystal. She says, uh, I can't believe Walsh missed again. WTF, very pissed right now. Robin Sullivan saying, well, this season has been quite a learning experience for the team. Malcolm with a couple of posts here saying, I agree. I agree, Joey Awajan. The woulda, coulda, shouldas need to stop with this team. Mm-hmm. Because I, and then he says, with our defense playing this good, as long as we don't turn the ball over, we win. Star candidate Malcolm, along with your call, of course, but star candidate comments there. Um, absolutely. Uh, because I, I said something how I was like, it was just another we should have won that game, but we didn't. Pisses me off. Mark Carlson wraps up this section with, more critical than winning this game is the fact that the players continue to progress and gel as a team. The quarterback made errors. The field kicker made errors. The defense held up better than I predicted. Yes. That's a huge key, and that's why Mark Carlson's a massive star candidate. In fact, you can kind of guess who the three stars are going to be, but maybe not in the order as, uh, maybe not in a certain order, but yeah, but there's a good chance three three guys are going to be in there. <laughs> well, maybe a fourth, actually. We'll see. Um, when I switch over to the other side, uh, I predicted very winnable game, lost in the last minutes of play. It's going to be tough, actually, to pass out the stars. I know there's going to be a couple more coming to the Twitter here in a second as we head over there. L Twitter. I was very active on there and uh, got a lot of tweets. May not be able to get to all of them because it's uh, unbelievably active today. Dave uh, Martin out of Scotland, Robin Sullivan, and Sebastian Balls all posting me. Even Pribble Pride had something to say as well, which was kind of cool. Not sure if they're a listener, but they're definitely a follower. Got to like that part. Oh, boy, this is a lot. I'm definitely not going to be able to get to everything. (laughs) What was one a couple days ago? Malcolm was saying he called in about one hour after the game. Not sure what happened. And he said, no problem, but I I like you getting it out quicker. Love listening on Mondays. And, yeah, I'm going to continue to do it this way because I I prefer to record on on Sundays because the game is fresher. I would think the listeners would be more interested in in fresher news, per se, you know, Monday sometimes, uh, sometimes I can be slightly sharper per se because I'll have more time to kind of get things together. But 
You know, it just is what it is. You got to do what you can do with your time. I mean, I got to make money to make a living. I have to go to work, and I have to work overtime, too, unfortunately. It just, it just is what it is out there, guys. It is what it is. Uh, Dave Martin was saying, so much so far with field goal miss. Sebastian Ball saying, Blair kicks like he has something up his ass. Yeah, because that was a horrible miss. 53-yarder at the time. Uh, huh, Martin was agreeing me. Mar- Dave Martin was agreeing me with me when I said I love all these commercials that act like everyone can afford these extremely expensive electronics for Christmas. What a joke. Yeah, um, (laughs) that's like a side rant right there that I got into. Well, only for that one tweet, though. But it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, do you really think just, I don't know. I mean, it's up to you what you decide what you can afford. And I personally think you're nuts. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's up to me to give my opinion too. I think you're nuts if you're out buying like nine hundred nine hundred or or thousand dollar like tablets, laptop type items for for your kids for Christmas or for this or that for Christmas. That that's nuts. That's that's just too much money, as far as I'm concerned. And they and they act like oh you know it's just like going to the store and buying something you know just like a simple thing like a you know like it's just going to the store. That's what the commercials act like, which kind of annoyed me a little bit. Uh, side rent there, side rent, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're spending like nine hundred dollars on a yeah it's again, it's up to you what you decide you can afford, but ugh, that that's a lot of money, man, I mean, that's just out of my league, man, that is out of my league, okay, uh Teddy or Teddy, Sebastian saying, I love Teddy, hate the old line, da da, yep, the third and twenty one was bad, yep, there were a lot of frustrating moments. Sebastian saying Josh Robinson needs to be cut, but he he's had some good moments and he's had some bad moments. He's uh, kind of he kind of is what he is. He's a guy that I think is limited, but he's also decent at times. He's a guy I wouldn't want to count on. Don't put him on their best receiver because you will get burned. Luckily today we did not, and I'm still shocked that we didn't. Dave Martin saying now that could really put us in the brown stuff, but I have a cold beer or two at hand. That being, of course. Rhodes limping, or Rhodes not limping off, but it's like he was limping, but it was his wrist. That's what was weird. It's like, I don't know, it's like he had this urge to limp, I suppose. Josh Robinson on Megatron, that's like, yeah, that's like, (laughs) that's like, uh, yeah, I don't even know. That's like putting little girls against, like, the Russian, or, yeah, against the Russian army, you know, during during the, uh, oh, even now. Yeah, not a good match. Uh, uh, Teddy looking good in balance. Yeah, that's what Sebastian was saying. But some of this is in-game stuff. I like to kind of, I like to look for this. Here we go. More kind of uh, in general conversation. Dave Martin was saying how the Lions looked flat, considering they are fighting for a divisional title. Lions at their best. Yeah, there you go. And yes, a a uh, combination that was growing really nice for us in the second quarter. Teddy to Charles Johnson, it's been an ongoing thing, but it was really, really uh, taking center stage at that point in the game, and it was really nice to see, and I think it will be an ongoing uh, combination that's very exciting for a lot of us, and I remember uh, when the uh, Detroit Lions got their first down, their first first down of the game, (laughs) I basically was saying, do I smell sarcasm, and then uh, Purple Pride saying, and the TV guys say, there's the crowd, completely missing it. Yep, <laughs> completely missing the fact that it was sarcasm. Robin Sullivan saying, my dear friend, tell me you didn't just realize that when I said breaking news, Matthew Stafford isn't that good. And no, I've been preaching it all year. He's just another Carson Palmer, basically. And of course, post-ACL, like I've said a bajillion times, post-ACL, he's another Carson Palmer. Pre-ACL, well, that's almost like a, almost a Peyton Manning level. I mean, that's how good Carson Palmer was pre ACL, and I'm saying the first ACL when he was with Cincinnati way back in uh, 2005. He was freaking awesome back then. Um, Dave Martin saying, the sound I like is the sound of a home team being booed. Oh, I I love it too, especially when we're on the road, per se, yes. (laughs) Um, Yep, Robin was saying she must have nodded off to the sermons that I was preaching about (laughs) Matthew Stafford. Look at you. Oh, funny. Lots of back and forth. Uh Uh-huh. Kind of more and more, uh, I'm kind of going to skip some of this, uh, this, uh, what, what do they call it? In game stuff. Uh, Sebastian saying bleep this late game shit. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, lots of back and forth. Seems like it's, uh, yeah, and then the sad play, the interception and such. 
think we're going to... Yeah, here we go. He said, is that another Dracer draft pick? So can he hit a 70-yarder in practice? Who cares? Cost us a win. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that being Blair Walsh. He hit a, he hit a 70-yard kick, amazingly, in practice this same week. How about that? How about that? Uh, Robin Sullivan saying, I can foresee an ass-chewing in the near future. And uh, there was a little conversation here. to saying... Yeah, here we go. Dave Martin, star candidate. You're turning into the most disappointing game of the season. And Robin's saying, yes, it is. We were kind of talking a bit back and forth there. I think we're about to wrap things up. Here we go. Uh, Dave saying, it was a, f- was a film called Bridge Too Far. How about you call this game a kick too far? Too far time to support the Lions. A kick too far. Yep, there you go. Time to support the Lions. No pack, no. And yes, the Lions would have the advantage over the Packers. Again, it's Dave Martin saying, if this loss means we've screwed the Packers out of home field advantage, I will take it. No pack, no. Definite star candidate there. Um, there you go. So there you go. We will wrap up the fan interaction segment there. Great, great, great fan interaction on this show. This is probably as good as we've had all season. And we've had a lot of good fan interaction all season. So that's a huge statement there. Time to pass out the Fran Tarkington and Tavares Jackson Awards, if you can believe it. Fran Tarkington is going to go... <laughs> it's going to go to Hodges. Yeah, I mean, Hodges... And, yeah, Hodges is going to get it. I'm going to actually give... <laughs> I'm going to actually give... The Fran Tarkin Award to Gerald Hodges. He was that good today. Two passes deflected. He led the team in solo tackles with seven. All over the place. Lots of energy. Fantastic game for Gerald Hodges. Really a difference maker out there. Xavier Rhodes, honorable mention. Really, really good as well. Despite the uh, the soreness and the injury on that wrist. I feel for him. Hopefully he can get that righted. Going into next week. Into South Beach. Into Miami. Tavares Jackson Memorial, well, it's Blair Walsh. Uh, it could be a lot of people, you know, and the Fran Targeting, it's like Terry Bridgewater could have been the Fran Targeting and the Tavares Jackson because he was so amazing when he was good and he was just, he killed us with those interceptions and some of those missed throws. Some of those missed throws could have been big plays and he missed people and it was really, 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 really frustrating missing uh, Jarius Wright on one that could have probably been a nice 30-yard gain or so. We would have, because he was pretty, pretty open. There was nobody near... Jerry is right. It might have been one of those Flight 97 ready for takeoff type plays. If not all the way to the end, maybe a 30, 30, 40 yard gain. And he missed him because he overthrew him. So there it is. Uh, but no, Blair Walsh ultimately is going to get the, um, he's going to get the DeVars Jackson today. His, his kicking looks really ugly and he's one of five overall because we'll throw out the 68 yarder. Almost impossible. That's kind of like throwing, that's like heaving a ball to the end zone. Uh, with zero time left and it's intercepted. You know, okay, yes, it's an interception and it counts as an interception just like the 68-yarder counts as a miss, but we're not going to count it as like a damn, why did he miss it type of kick. But one for five, seriously? And yes, he got blocked, but still the kick did look a little bit low. That's partially on him, that's partially on the holder, and that's partially on the line as well. I expect actually mostly on the line. But again, Blair Walsh has been very disappointing of late. There it is. So, ah, uh, boy, the stars. Where do I pass these out? Jeez, this is going to be really tough. <laughs> this might be the toughest I've ever done. Bronze star? Boy, it's... Bronze star is going to go to Dave Martin. Dave Martin's going to get the bronze star out of northern Scotland. He's going to get the bronze star over there <laughs> in northern Scotland. Silver star is going to go... To <laughs> Mark Carlson and Sebastian Balls. Those guys get the silver star for the day. Good posts all over the place. In fact, amazing. <sighs> Going to give the gold star to Malcolm. Welcome back to the show and some great posts along the way. Really had some strong comments. And really liked the call as well. Liked a lot of the things he had to say on the show today. Really, Mark Carlson and... <laughs> Malcolm, either one of them could be gold stars. But today, uh, today I will give it to Malcolm. He is really it just it was. He had some great takes, and this is his week for that. Congratulations! There it is, Malcolm, gold star. All right, 
with that, <laughs> let's wrap this show up. It's actually longer than I was planning to do. Lots to say, lots to talk about, a trillion interactions. This is kind of a, yeah, this is a lot of interactions today. Really busy show. And, um, well, it's funny how in the... <laughs> In the in the uh, the winter ad for tall grass, it's like I lied so much for so much for winter and snow. There is no winter and snow. It's basically an extended November. Yeah, it's been warm up, but it's ugly as bleep. I would prefer. I'm looking forward to colder weather and some snow. Actually, I don't like this brown, brown and clouds and mist every day. This is this thing. Yeah, I, you know, I, I have almost no energy. In fact, I don't think it's helping me do the show with this type of crappy weather. I think I I think I feel weaker. I feel out of <laughs> out of sync a little bit right now mentally physically could use a little sunlight uh i need a recharge i mean my battery's low ladies and gentlemen yet i still am doing the show as long as i am as crazy as i am because there's a million things to talk about today and uh, you know throughout the game and of course a lot of you had things to say as well and this was an amazing fan interaction week thank you all so much a gold star week for fan interaction for 2014 at least so far We'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks. And again, I cannot, cannot wait until the postseason. Those shows are some of my favorite all-time shows throughout the course of the history of Purple Mafia. And this is the eighth season of Purple Mafia. Unbelievable. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Do tell a friend. Do give us a review and rating on iTunes. If you could, you will definitely get a star. Maybe it'll be a gold star. Maybe it'll be silver. Maybe it'll be bronze. But you'll very likely get a star. And it doesn't reflect on you having a, you like, oh, that's that's all you get as a bronze star. It's just sometimes some comments are so bleeping good, they deserve a gold star, damn it. And today that was Malcolm. So thank you again so very much for all of your participation. Again, do tell your friends about the show if you can. And if not, if you're not uh, unable to get anybody to listen, man, it is what it is, you know. <laughs> it is what it is. I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to, know that that uh, more and more people are coming to listen to the show, but right now, I mean, I appreciate all of you that do listen. So, that's not, that's more important, actually, ultimately, than anything else, is those of you that do listen on a weekly basis. You're the reason I do the show. You're the reason I do the show, and as Malcolm said, love you guys. I'll leave you with that. Take care, everybody, and, uh, well, <laughs> stay cool. <laughs> <laughs>